uh, uh, hello to everyone who's joining us. Now, uh, as has been mentioned, the timetable is very tight tight and the panel is quite large so I'm just going to give short introductions uh, for people and uh, you can get more uh, information about their bios uh, from the material you have. Now we have with us today Professor uh, John Dewa who is the Vice-Chancellor at La Trobe University and Chair of Universities Australia Chris Fike, who's a senior publisher at Black Inc. and the editor of Quarterly Essay. Dr. Kathy Foley, who is Australia's chief scientist and uh, uh, has had an extensive career previously at the CSIRO. Uh, Andrew Lee, who is the shadow assistant uh, minister for treasury and charities and a local member here in Canberra, local federal member. Professor Deborah Lupton, who is Sharp Professor in the Faculty of Arts, Design and Architecture at the University of New South Wales. And Daniel Wood, who is the CEO of the Grattan Institute and has published extensively on economic reform. So um, we will be discussing uh, the uh, general place and function of the social sciences in this round table. And I'll throw some questions to the panel members and uh, other uh, people in the panel might want to come in on, on some of those answers. First, let me make three very brief points that our speakers might like to also take up. Firstly, I think um, it's something of a cold climate for the social sciences at the moment, insofar as the views of the federal government are concerned, certainly. They're absolutely not in favour when the government is thinking about higher education. Secondly, I think one of the problems the social sciences face today is the polarisation of the political and social debate. The social sciences, sciences flourish best in a tolerant atmosphere and tolerance, especially in the age of social media, is unfortunately often in short supply. Third, and this is referenced in the report we've just been hearing about, we have a worrying problem, I think, with the democratic deficit. And I think this is one of the challenges for the social sciences in our time. And so let's move to, uh, to the panel discussion. John Dewa, why does social science research seemingly have so little impact, or at least not as much impact as we'd like to see on public policy these days? Who is to blame? Thanks, Michelle. Um I guess it's a it's an open question whether the premise is accurate, namely that it does have little impact, and that's something we might discuss. But um, I, I, in pre preparing for this, I read again Stuart McIntyre's book, *The Poor Relation: The History of Social Sciences in Australia*, and a book that was published in two thousand and ten offered a pretty gloomy view of the impact of social science um, in Australia, um, and I don't think things have improved much since then, and if anything, they've probably got worse. Um, there are a number of possible explanations, and these are, I offer these as hypotheses, but one of them has to do with what the Grattan Institute recently called the gridlock in government, and I'm sure Danielle can speak to that, but John, Daly, John Daly's parting shot on departing from the Grattan Institute, I think um, very, very articulately identified a number of the causes of this, um, I won't go into those now because we, we may get into them later on. Um, another possible cause is that the work uh, academic social scientists do um, may not be addressing the right questions. Are, are we trying to solve the problems that people care about? Um, and if we are, are we celebrating the, the results of that and the impact that it has? Um, and one of the things I really enjoyed about reading the State of the Social Sciences report, which I think is excellent, by the way, 
um, was the point it made about the difficulty of measuring impact in the social sciences, which in turn makes it difficult to measure um, the, the, the successes, I suppose. And I'll, I'll just make one other point. There are lots of others we could make, but uh, another possibility is that universities themselves have become places where it's hard for public intellectuals to thrive. And it's often the public intellectuals who are best able to communicate the importance of social science and its impact. Um, this is a point that Robert Mann, who's one of my emeritus professors at La Trobe, keeps making to me. He keeps telling me that we, we, we are so managerial, we manage the time of our academics uh, to, to within an, an inch of their lives. And it means that they're so busy chasing grants and publications that, that we don't give them time to, 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 to have this public conversation to promote the social sciences. So I think there's a complex web of interplaying factors here um, that, that mean that it's a, it is a challenging and hostile environment, as you say, Michelle. I think I should put in an ad here for the conversation as one <laughs> conduit for academics who want to get out their work and their opinion. Danielle, would you like to come in at this point as the Grattan Institute's been mentioned? Uh, yes, um, very, very happy to. So I'm maybe, um, I'm a little more upbeat than that. I mean, I, I agree with all of John's points and I, I think um, there are a, a lot of barriers to making policy change happen, which is, is broader than just the, the social sciences and um, definitely uh, recommend you have a look at the, the gridlock report, which touches on some of those around um, you know, party tribalism, around difficulty in doing things that are unpopular, around the role of vested interests. Um, but, you know, I think in the kind of post-COVID or with COVID world, um, we are sensing a bit more of an appetite, um, particularly at the state government level, I must say. Uh, it can be a bit more challenging with the Commonwealth government level um, to actually start talking about policy again. Um, so just to give you um, some kind of sense of that, you know, we're an organisation of 25 people. I've got six research leads. Um, we've held over 200 meetings with, with political officers, politicians and political officers this year, probably the same number again with bureaucrats. Uh, and, you know, being a think tank, we, we sort of at the, the translational point, we're sort of taking academic research and our own research and trying to put it into terms of policymakers grapple with. Um, but we are finding that there is an interest in, in ideas and talking about these things. So I think that's, um, you know, good news. I think the challenge um, for the academic world has always been the extent to which um, the incentives are there to actually do that translation piece. So go from the research uh, to putting it into terms that policymakers um, can engage with. And I think particularly for junior academics, my concern has been that um, the way in which incentives are set up, which is around publishing in, in top tier journals, generally not the journals that are going to be running Australian specific research um, and all the additional time that you need to, to actually shift from research to policy change. So that's, you know, doing those meetings, talking to public servants, putting in submissions to, to Senate inquiries, writing the pieces in the conversation or in mainstream um, newspapers, uh, you know, all of that is kind of the part of the hard slog of <laughs> policy change. And do we actually create the, the space for, you know, our best and brightest to be doing that? I think, you know, you do see a lot of really great senior academics that have the chance, but I don't think we create the space for, for junior academics to do the work. And I think that does um, reduce the way in which social science research then translates to policy impact. Andrew Lee, I wonder whether one of the problems faced here is the fact that everything in the uh, public uh, political debate these days is seen as political and we have moved into such an era of hyper-partisanship. So there is, in a way, less emphasis, I feel anyway, on longer-term policy and less emphasis on being willing on some issues to operate uh, across the aisle, as it were. Well, thanks, Michelle, for the for a great question, as uh, as always. Uh, look, I'm pretty optimistic about this. I I take the uh, points that uh, Danielle and John have made 
But I do think that the main problem that the social sciences face in a policy sense uh, is a government rather than a set of institutions. Uh, a visiting OECD expert uh, said earlier this year that the Morrison government is the most anti-university government in the OECD, with the exception perhaps of Hungary. Uh, and that is a, a benchmark which is uh, uh, pretty much broadly recognised across the sector. Uh, Ian Jacobs' recent comments, uh, now that he's outgoing from UNSW, uh, really went to the heart of the hostility that the government's evincing towards the sector. But no one should mistake that for a lack of passion about the social sciences on my side of parliament. Uh, I was in a caucus committee meeting this morning um, discussing the social, uh, social science findings with colleagues. Uh, there's a, a great interest in, under, in bringing social science to bear uh, on issues uh, like compulsory income management uh, and the right level of the job seeker benefit. Uh, there's great engagement with uh, policy, with uh, uh, intellectuals when it comes to thinking about migration policy, the hard questions around refugees, temporary migration. Uh, Abel Risby's uh, recent, recent book is uh, terrific. And Tanya Plibersek has a, uh, a Labor reading group which brings together uh, Labor people to discuss uh, big books, including Abel's and uh, 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 Ross Garno's earlier this year, among many others. Um, I've co-authored a handful of papers this year with uh, academics and uh, just go have a book about to come out with MIT Press, which goes to the challenge of long-term risk. Uh, and I'm, I'm not Robinson Crusoe in this. There is a, a real interest in ideas and an interest in engaging with the experts. Uh, my parliamentary colleagues are, are constantly keen to know who to call on particular uh, policy challenges. Often that's academics. Often that's people at the Grattan Institute. Uh, and I would be engaging with one of Danielle's 25 uh, research leads or Danielle herself uh, at least on a weekly basis, if not more often. Uh, so people should have a sense of optimism uh, about the ability of parliamentarians to continue to engage uh, and about the way in which that shaped the system. You know, we wouldn't have HEX the way it is if it wasn't for uh, the strong uh, advocacy from Bruce Chapman and the engagement through the policy process. Uh, the way in which Australia did move to child support in the late 1980s, saying that the government would chase up debts but would ensure that the, uh, that the uh, uh, custodial parent got the money. All of those things reflect great engagement with policymakers, uh, as indeed uh, did Australia's policy response uh, to recent economic slumps. Uh, so I'm a congenital optimist, but I'm really an optimist about this one. Uh, I think people should continue to engage. Uh, feel free to use me as a conduit. I'm a, a fellow of the Academy, uh, but a, a, just a, a passionate uh, believer that we need to, uh, to improve the conduit between the world of power and the world of ideas. Well, that's, that's a twist on I'm here from the government and here to help. <laughs> Um, Kathy, can I ask you about uh, a view from the inside and do you feel that it's easier to get uh, messages uh, across from the physical sciences than the social sciences uh, and, and what advice would you give uh, to those, uh, apart from what Andrew's already said, uh, who are wanting to uh, engage from the social sciences, with whether it's with the politicians or with bureaucrats or others in government or officialdom. Well, yeah, hi everyone. Yeah, it's good to be here. I think I am. I have the easy side of things when it comes to research because I'm a physicist, and I think Einstein said it really well when he said, "Understanding physics is child's play compared to understanding child's play." And social science actually, I think, is the most difficult of sciences because it's something where it's not like it's black and white. It's not like there's a right and wrong answer. It's actually, as we've heard, it's about ideas. It's about looking at social systems. And it's very broad from you know, psychology through to law, through to so many dis disciplines that it's, it's actually uh, hard to sort of categorize it in any one area. And that makes a complexity too, where I would say the majority of the world does not actually understand what social science is. And yet what I'm seeing is social science has been absolutely critical for me to deliver on anything I do. 
Um, for example, this year um, I've been going through uh, being asked to put science at the heart of, of government policy, which is fantastic. But what is really interesting is that I've said over and over again is that science on its own is useless. Unless you engineer it, unless you've got the social license, you've got the business model, you've got the legal uh, requirements, regulation, policy settings, all those things are needed. And that's sort of science is probably a, a very small part of it. Um, most of the other bits I mentioned are all the social science areas. So I, my feeling is that um, there's a great opportunity to look at the successes of social science, which often, you know, to go hunting for is hard to see. I, it was great to hear from Andrew uh, about the, the long list of things which we can point to a consequence of social science inputs. But even things which are commercial, such as the, um, uh, one of the things is the uh, triple P, you know, the, uh, uh, the child um, parenting I, don't know what the, all the P's stand for, but it's a, a program which is being taken um, and adopted all around the world to teach parents how to be better parents. And that's become quite a successful commercial thing apart from anything else. And that's just an example of something where it's not just that narrow academic side of things, but showing the broader context, which I think is often missed. And, um, and I guess the other is also, uh, I know uh, the Academy's heard me say this before, is the mindset of saying that we're the poor cousin of science and, in, and the physical and natural sciences, I, I would like to say it's the enabling part of that. And I think what we've seen as a consequence of the COVID pandemic is a really good example. We saw that um, there was a lot of hesitancy towards being vaccinated. The science was all there, but it was only when the social science was wheeled out, when we understood what it was, how to actually engage with the broader community, what is the right communication message, how to go about that. Suddenly we saw that flip happen in around July when the social science actually was the part of what was done to really navigate the system. So I, I would really like to see if we could change the narrative, identify where um, social science fits in so that it is understood. So there's some of the things that come to mind for me. Do you think we need a chief social scientist as well as a chief scientist? <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I, I guess I've been uh, trying to uh, say that I'm uh, science in the broader sense. So I uh, feel that I um, embrace the social sciences and, and, and the humanities and, and arts as well because they're part of that whole system. I know everyone's sick of hearing about ecosystems, but it really is. You don't actually have one bit on its own. And I think... For too long, we've been dealing with all the different disciplines from right through from the you know, hard line physical sciences, which I'm part of, all the way through to the humanities and arts. It's only that spectrum working together that we actually see uh, transformation happening. And so uh, I, I guess hopefully in the role I have, I can support it if there isn't a chief social scientist. Chris Fike, if I can come to you, in terms of public interest, do you think that uh, the the general public, the the general public who take an interest in issues, are hungry for information about a range of uh, serious policy issues, or have we become very um, popular and populist in our our tastes, our reading tastes? Uh, I, look, I'm also on the optimist team. Um, I think it's clear that there's an appetite. Uh, the example that comes to mind is the Ross Garno book uh, published called Superpower, uh, Australia's Low Carbon Opportunity. Um, that's a book that sold almost 20,000 copies. Uh, it introduced a new idea into Australia's public sphere, I think, um, and it uses words like intertemporal utility discount rate, but people were prepared to uh, work their way through that uh, because they felt that the idea was important to understand and they were interested in it as an idea. So I think um, there's an appetite there, but I think I agree with Andrew's analysis that there's resistance from the federal government possibly even hostility at times. And I think that the universities haven't necessarily been well served in terms of providing people with incentives to write and sometimes the skills they need. But I think in a way there's been compensating factors. So the Grattan Institute fills the gap 
the conversation, I think, is a shining light in this and showing how editors and academics can work together to produce material that then's placed in the press. Uh, so I think there's a kind of flourishing ecology of this kind of work, but it could certainly be a lot stronger. Deborah, if I can bring you in here, to what extent do you think that a shortage of, of funding is a problem? And it was mentioned earlier, the time that is spent on preparing uh, briefs and, and applications. Has this, this sort of bureaucratic process, and we all believe in accountability, but has this got out of control? And also, if I can add this, do you think that there's uh, political... Uh, preferences and, and political influence in, in the research process these days? Well, I think everyone from any discipline would uh, say that who's working in the academy at the moment would say that there's a huge amount of time spent um, on writing grant applications. We all have to do it. And regardless of what discipline you're in, the success rate is really, really low. It's true that medical researchers have access to a greater source of funding through the NH and MRC and through the Medical Research Futures Fund. Having said that, there are those of us in the social sciences who do cross over, such as myself, into medicine and public health, and we have won funding through those medically and public health oriented sources of funding as well, which is fortunate for us. Um, I, you know, there has been there has been examples of certain ministers of education making captains' choices in terms of they, they are in a position where they do have to um, agree for funding from major funding bodies, even though successful applications have been properly reviewed. It's the minister who signs off, and there have been examples where there has been a political, I think, political intervention there. Not recently, not the last few years, but a few years ago they, that did happen. So that is a problem, but it seems not to be happening right now, fortunately. Um, but what I would like to say to stimulation to building on um, the impact of social scientists is think about whenever you turn on the radio, read the newspaper, read the conversation, of course, um, watch television, there are social scientists being interviewed uh, for their perspectives on the, the, you know, the, the contemporary compelling social issues of the day all the time, far more than scientists are, far more than medical researchers are, because we research people's everyday lives and journalists constantly turn to us for our um, expert opinion, for our commentary on the compelling social issues of the time. Um, those of us trained in public health were able to have a massive intervention into researching people's experiences of COVID. I've done interviews with people and I've been just been considering that all the anti-vaccination and other anti-public um, health policies that are going on right now. Um, I'm going through interviews that, that I've done with people all around Australia. Um, I'm thinking of a, a young woman who was interviewed, who, a young mother who talked about how she hated being forced to be vaccinated, but she did it because she had to do it for her job. But she also talked about how stressful it was for her to be homeschooling her very young children and all the pressures on her over this time. She wasn't an anti-vaxxer, but she said she, she didn't like having to be forced uh, to, to, take, to, to take the vaccination. Um, I think social scientists can offer so much nuance when we do this kind of really detailed in-depth research and we are then able to translate our findings when we are interviewed as public experts, um, as public intellectuals or just as experts in other ways in the media and we're constantly being called upon. So I'm, I'm also, I think we're constantly showing the importance of our research when we engage in that way. I've written a lot of com uh, articles for the conversation, um, constantly pitching, um, and I think that's a really important venue, but I'm interviewed for lots of other um, media outlets as well. And I too am on the optimistic side of things. And I think it's up to us as, as social scientists to put ourselves forward. I'm also finding scientists are coming and approaching me, cold calling me, asking me to collaborate with them. So I'm really pleased to see the way that the people from STEM are beginning to recognise the importance of the social sciences as well. And I, I find that really um, fantastic to see. And I think maybe us as social scientists should be reaching out more to people in STEM. 
Danielle, do you think uh, the pandemic has been, uh, if I can put it this way, good for experts? Have experts been among the few winners out of the pandemic because they've got more recognised? Or in the later stages of the pandemic, have we in fact seen more pressure on experts that um, they've they've found themselves drawn into the political process, which is uh, often not a very comfortable place to be? Yeah, it's a great question. So I certainly, there was certainly data early on in the pandemic um, that suggested that it, it was great for experts. So uh, public, public trust in all sorts of institutions went up uh, and people were really seeing the value of expertise feeding into to policy to respond to the pandemic. Uh, and we certainly, I think there was uh, was experts experts as far as the eye can see. So you know, epidemiologists were becoming household names, but we were also seeing a lot so of so many of them too. Who knew indeed, we had so many? <laughs> and they, I, I remember reading an article that they were, you know, getting uh, people, fans approaching them at the supermarket and all sorts of things. But I think um, we definitely saw a lot of social sciences. Uh, social scientists out there in, in those public debates as well and it, it clearly wasn't just a health response it was a an economic response a very much a kind of human dimension to the pandemic response um in more recent times and, and i don't have data to, to back this up michelle but i suspect some people um have found themselves in very difficult and contested debates so we are now seeing um, some pretty ugly scenes around things like vaccine mandates, um, the, um, the new Victorian health order bill. Um, and, you know, we're, we're hearing more and more about um, politicians facing death threats and, and, and some pretty nasty correspondence. Um, the same is happening to experts in this space. Um, so I, I know of people within Grattan that have experienced this. Um, I've, I've heard from other academics as well. Um, so I think that is a, a sort of a dangerous development and I think it would be a real shame if the actions of you know what what is frankly still a very small percentage of the population were to deter people from sharing their expertise uh, we need it more than ever uh, and I hope you know I think it's um, you know really important that employers universities and others um, find ways to support people through this because what we don't want to see is people um, taking a step back and not being willing or able to participate in these debates and sharing their expertise. Chris, do you think uh, experts are now becoming somewhat publicity shy? Not in my experience. Uh, people um, like to get their ideas out usually. Uh, so I think that it's been a great shot in the arm for, well, not only epidemiologists, but also social scientists who've been asked about the vaccine rollout um, and I think you can sense with climate scientists, um, they're crying out for the help of social scientists as a way of conveying the depth of the climate crisis as well. So I, th I think that this is, I think experts are still wanted, um, although I agree that there are toxic aspects to that, where people um, can now be attacked for their views in which the, the way they weren't before, but that's not, it's, still, it's not a mainstream thing at all. So, uh, John, can I ask you about um, relations with government? Uh, your Chair of Universities Australia, how difficult is this engagement at the moment? From, from outside, it looks quite challenging, if I can put it in the mildest possible form. Thanks, Michelle. Um, yes, I don't think anyone would, would deny that um, it, it has been a, a challenging time. Um, I think there are a number of factors that have contributed to that. Um, I think the government has um, had a view that universities um, ha have not taken some things seriously as, uh, as seriously as government would like. So things like freedom of speech, foreign interference. Um, and I, I think there's a view that universities have become too reliant on international students before the pandemic and that we were sort of getting our comeuppance during, during the course of it. Um, I, I think all of those are unfair, of course, um, but I, I, I don't think it's helped um, to, to cre create a positive environment um, for, for dialogue with government. Um, that said, we shouldn't forget that the government did tip in a billion dollars in the budget last year to top up the research block grant. That was an absolute 
lifesaver and and clearly uh someone in government listens to those who are advocating and kathy may have been one of them um for a, a lifeline support for university research so it, it hasn't been wholly negative um but there have been that there are some some uh aspects of the relationship that that haven't been as, as harmonious as they could have been. I, I, th I mean, I think universities have done a huge amount to try and address those concerns. You know, the, the French model code has now been fully implemented across the sector. Um, the Foreign Interference Task Force has uh, recommended a revised set of guidelines, which will significantly lift the, the sector's capability to, to deal with that issue. Um, and, I, you know, the, the fact that the sector is so reliant on overseas students is in itself a product of many years of government policy. Um, and it, it feels unfair for the, for the sector to be blamed for the consequences of not just this government, but governments over many years, frankly, of both sides of politics um, who have explicitly or tacitly encouraged the sector to increase its revenue from non-government sources so that government funding could be reduced. What, of course, the, the, the pandemic has done is to expose the fragility of that. Um, and I think we will need a conversation with governments of, of either color going, going forward about how the nation sustains its research capability properly, um, rather than relying on uh, alternative sources of revenue. Well, Andrew, would you like to see, would Labour like to see the university sector uh, become less dependent on foreign students? Would this be useful in terms of uh, the whole academic marketplace, workplace? Michelle, I think the uh, engagement with international students has brought a great deal to the university sector, uh, not just cash, and I think it is uh, you know, there's no sense in which John is doing this, but we always need to be careful when we're talking about international students that we're not simply characterising people as cash cows. You know, you look at the number of ministers in Indonesia who have been educated in Australia. That's extraordinary influence and soft power in our region. Uh, and the, uh, the way in which international students uh, have pressed for, uh, for new subjects to be studied, brought new perspectives. Uh, I've taught a, a bunch of uh, international students and loved having them in the class. Uh, and international academics too, I think are really important. Uh, when I headed the economics division of the Research School of Social Sciences at ANU, uh, I was one of only two Australian born people in the, in the corridor uh, and uh, really appreciated the breadth of, uh, of perspectives that that brings. I remember Brian Schmidt once saying that uh, only at ANU could he have done the international research and in, uh, astrophysics that won in the Nobel Prize. Uh, so uh, I, I think we need to be, uh, be encouraging international students to return. Obviously, diversification of sources is, uh, is vital given the fragility of the China relationship. But universities are alive to that and moving toward, towards that swiftly. Uh, and we need uh, stronger funding of universities. Uh, I'd love personally to see a return to the demand-driven system. Uh, at a time in which we've got technology running apace, it makes no sense to be pressing the pause button on uh, education. Uh, if you think about the Claudia Golden, Larry Katz model that uh, inequality is a race between education and technology, uh, there is a real danger that uh, we become more unequal as a country uh, if we allow technology to advance while education stagnates and uh, going away from the demand-driven university system uh, along with the uh, problems we're seeing in vocational education uh, does take us away from being the high educated country, which I think is where our, our prosperity and our egalitarianism lies. Uh, Deborah, one of the uh, new interfaces between government and the university sector, the higher education sector, has been over this issue of foreign interference. Now, this seems to mainly affect the, the, the science sciences, uh, the more technology uh, driven aspects of research and so on, but does it affect also the social sciences? And how do you read the situation now? Is it is it a problem for the universities? Is it limiting research? Well, it's an interesting phenomenon, Michelle, because of course we had um, a period where there was there was funding um, available through 
Chinese government to set up research institutes um, at various universities. And, and you can see that as a form of soft power. I don't think it was about, um, you know, of course, you brainwashing or anything like that. I don't think we can apply conspiracy theories or anything like that to it. It was a form of soft power in terms of promoting relationships between Australian researchers and Chinese researchers. We are aware that uh, social research has shown that some Chinese students have felt intimidated or um, felt that they may have been targeted um, based on ideas that they were conduits towards uh, Chinese intelligence. So I think as social researchers, we need to be really aware of that kind of um, position that Chinese students can sometimes be put in, or at least the perception um, of Chinese students being placed in that position. Um, I think that's something really important that, that, that the social science, sciences should focus on. But what I'm also aware of is, um, particularly um, in the social policy sector, we've got some really interesting Chinese researchers, people who were born in China now working in Australia, who are doing really important social science work about Chinese social policy and also about the Chinese diaspora here in Australia, of course, which is huge, um, and able to cross that divide, that cultural and language divide. Um, between the diaspora here and um, the situation in China. So um, I think we, we're doing a lot in social sciences. We could do more though. Um, I'm, I'm, it's, you know, it's really hard to know how foreign, foreign interference may happen or how it is mobilised because, you know, it's all very secretive and I'm not a political scientist and that might not be the best person to answer that question. But I do see... And in terms of social policy research, there is some important research going on right now in Australia. John, do you have a, an overview of um, how the, the sector is dealing with this issue of uh, government concern about foreign interference, especially um, on the social science side? Yeah, so um, the, the government established, well, the government and Universities Australia established a foreign interference task force about three years ago, um, drew up a, an initial set of guidelines um, and they've just been revised. Um, and the purpose of the revision was to enable both um, universities and the government to get a better handle on the measures that universities are taking to combat um, foreign interference. And that, that's a very broad term and encompasses many, many different uh, possible threats. Um, I think the, 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 the concern has been ma mainly focused on the hard sciences, um, where there are concerns about, for example, dual use technologies um, that, that can be deployed for um, military or, or surveillance purposes, when they, that may not have been their original intention, um, and, and the loss of key IP around um, major major uh, initiatives in core or core research areas which are considered to be important to national security. Um, one of the things that the university successfully argued was that in applying these rules, um, universities should be allowed to take into account the, the real level of risk threat posed by a researcher's field of research. So someone working in um, uh, missile guidance systems, for example, there might be a much bigger threat there than there is uh, for someone who's a lecturer in, say, me medieval poetry, um, and that there was that the universities are able to take into account those 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 threat differences. But uh, the uh, my feeling is that there have been some um, areas of concern um, which are, are ju justified, um, but we will know a lot more once these new guidelines have been. Uh, rolled out and, and universities start um, uh, getting a sense of the, the state of affairs in each of their institutions. The whole freedom of speech debate has also impacted on universities in, in the last uh, few years and, and especially has exercised uh, the government. Uh, what do people feel about the effect this has on universities? Do you think that uh, it, people feel more constrained than they were? Chris, would you like to start off on this? Uh, I can't comment much on that. Uh, 
as part of La Trobe University Press, we recently published a book called Open Minds by Adrian Stone and Carolyn Evans that deals with this topic. But I personally deal with uh, scholars, but I don't deal with the academic institution very much. So I can't really comment on the freedom of speech side of universities. Deborah, what do you think? Social scientists, and particularly, I guess, maybe sociologists like myself, have a great passion for social justice and for um, identifying and surfacing where they see social injustice happening, social inequalities happening. So they tend to be fairly, well, maybe I'm speaking, you know, I can't speak for everyone, but many of us tend to feel fairly that it's very important to be able to have a voice um, and to, you know, it's, it is a very tenuous situation because we don't want people coming to universities who are saying incredibly offensive um, and incorrect things. So, of course, that it's a very, it's a fine balance between acknowledging the right of people to have a say and to put their, their position forward and their opinions forward, but they should not do so. From a sociological perspective, they should not do so in a way that is defamatory or discriminatory or is hate speech. So there are um, a couple of issues here, aren't there? There are people coming onto the campus invited by groups or whatever and um, putting forward views that are highly controversial and, and maybe have all sorts of other implications. And there's also the whole question of academic freedom and, and people... Uh, some academics having uh, views that are, are not considered correct or uh, are, are totally minority views and arguments about their rights. Yes, that's true. That, that, that's part of the whole spectrum of, of academic freedom and the right to um, the right to express your considered opinion as an expert in an area. And again, there's a difference between being an expert, having conducted research or serious thinking on an issue, um, and having a, a very biased perspective on an issue that may be coloured by um, some kind of prejudicial view on certain social groups. We've seen, we've seen that very, very recently, actually, in relation to um, opposition against transgender people, which has caused a lot of debate amongst university communities, and, and it's involved researchers at universities sort of arguing with each other. Um, Look, I don't, I don't know if I have all the solutions to this particular issue, only to say that it is a very delicate balance um, and I guess it's like pornography that, you know, we recognise hate speech when we see it um, and uh, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of speaking and deliberation and public debate that should be avoided if it, if it veers mm. into that level of... Um, in, 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 very intense um, discrimination or, or some form of racism or other isms against people. We've only got a couple of minutes left, so we'll just try and get in a, a, a couple of things very quickly. Daniel, do you think that the rise of think tanks, uh, and we've seen them all around the place, specialist and, and, and more generalist think tanks, ideological ones and, and less ideological ones. Have they helped the social sciences or uh, have they put enormous pressure on those practising the social sciences in higher education and similar institutions? Well, probably unsurprisingly, I would like to argue that uh, think tanks have hopefully helped. Um, I mean, ultimately, think tanks should be playing a translational role. We should be taking the best of the research that's going on in, in academia and packaging it up uh, in making it really relevant to, to policymakers and, and showing them how um, it can affect positive change. So I, th I think, um, I hope on net, it's been a positive contribution. Certainly at Grattan, we spend a lot of time um, talking to academic colleagues right across the country, reading their papers uh, and, and trying to make the research come alive. Um, in, I mean, I, I think you're right that it has become a slightly bigger think tank field maybe than a decade ago, although we still have far fewer think tanks per capita than a, a lot of other nations. Um, I've never thought of that measure of think tanks per capita. <laughs> <laughs> That's the ultimate statistic. The ultimate statistic. I'm going to think tank. I like the numbers. 
Um, I mean, sometimes people, um, there are think tanks, I think, that spend a lot more time on the advocacy piece than the than the research and policy piece, and they can take up quite a lot of uh, oxygen in the public debate. So I think if that's coming at the expense of, of hearing from people that uh, actually do the research, then, then that's not always a good thing. Uh, but I think overall, hopefully, it's had a, a positive impact. So, Cathy, if I can just ask you quickly, uh, what do you think are going to be the the big challenges for the big policy challenges for the social scientists in the next few years? Well, I think one of the biggest things is looking at how our digital economy actually is implemented in a way which is fair, the ethics associated with it is going to be major, uh, going through looking at what is the impact and also measuring the impact uh, where, where they're able to on things such as bias in algorithms, uh, making a, giving uh, policy advice on, on what, what are the outcomes if you go one direction or another so that you're able to see the consequences of those sorts of technical inputs. I think we're going to be um, seeing the need for uh, understanding how people move from one area of um, career and we're seeing this over the next 30 years where we've committed to, uh, to having a low emissions economy. So that means people in, in uh, high emissions uh, in occupations will have to shift into areas of low emissions occupations. And so what does that look like? How do we set ourselves up to support people to transition? And then I guess the other is also um, the biggest issue, I think we'll be making sure that our population is educated in the areas where there are the jobs and opportunities and that, that we make sure that we engage in the research that's needed to understand what attracts young people to make the decision to go down a particular career pathway and how can we make sure those uh, settings are in place so that it's not just STEM, STEM, STEM all the way, but it's all the stuff that go, goes around it, that we understand what are the right business models because uh, social science also brings in, uh, in uh, marketing and all the things that go with business. How do we make sure that we come up with the new business models that are going to be able to be implemented to uh, take on board the opportunities that new technologies bring along as well? And I guess the final thing is making the, the research that's necessary to uh, make sure that we've got a society that's equitable, that is inclusive, and, um, and takes on board how to manage this um, broad range of issues that come about because on one end you've got people who have got very strong views and we're seeing this coming through in terms of, uh, say, uh, uh, anti-vaxxing through to uh, some of the things that have been uh, uh, in the media and, and with all the different protests that are going on at the moment. What is that telling us as a society that we're not uh, actually embracing what the full complement of thoughts are and how we make sure that we cater for all aspects of society in the way we govern ourselves and how we make decisions as a, as a society in general? Well, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I think uh, it's good to have uh, heard that uh, some, some people are optimistic in an age of pessimism, especially around higher education. So uh, the, the optimism is really uh, encouraging to see. And the other thing is that out of the whole pandemic, we have seen this uh, positive message that the community does respect experts, even if the experts nowadays have been uh, dragged by the, the politicians, especially into uh, not very good places sometimes. But I think the, the general population has come out of this with a new respect for experts, both on, on the, the science side and the social science side. So thank you to, your, to you all. Uh, sorry, we haven't had more time, but uh, your your views uh, really have, have been very insightful and, and different. And I think those in the audience will have got a lot out of the session. So thanks to you all again. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Michelle. And thanks to all our uh, participants and our panel. We're going to take a short break now, but we'll resume at one o'clock with a session, Can Australia Achieve Meaningful Reconciliation with First Nations? Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.